Resuming debate, the Honourable Member for South Okanagan, West Kootenai. Well, thank you, Mr. Speaker. And I'm happy to rise here today to speak to Bill C-48, the Oil Tanker Moratorium Act. And, you know, a North Coast tanker ban has been a legislative priority of the NDP for many years. And we welcome the fact that the Liberals are finally taking action on this issue. This bill calls for a ban on tanker traffic carrying more than 12,500 metric tons of crude oil uh, on the northwest coast of Canada. It makes exceptions for refined oil products like diesel and gasoline in order for coastal communities to be resupplied. So right off the top, the bill does nothing to prevent refined oil spills like the Nathan E. Stewart disaster from threatening our coast. And we're concerned that Bill C-48 also gives the minister broad arbitrary powers to exempt vessels from the ban and define what fuels are covered by the Act. We hope that the government will implement constructive amendments to limit ministerial power and increase spill response resources. Now, I've had the good fortune and privilege of traveling to the North Coast, to working on the North Coast of BC numerous times. I've been on that wild coast uh, going around the, the eelgrass beds of Flora Bank when I was working on the environmental assessment for the Ridley Island terminals. I've worked on charter sailboat uh, natural history cruises around the coast of Moresby Island, uh, acting as a, a natural history resource person. And for a, a young guy from the desert grasslands of the Okanagan Valley, it was, those experiences were really life-changing life experiences. And it is truly a wild coast. I remember one ferry trip across to Haida Gwaii, across Hecate Strait, where the ferry was taking green water uh, on the third deck, the, the restaurant deck. Sand was coming up from the bottom of Hecate Strait, in the middle of the strait, uh, onto the, the boat's decks. Large semi-trailer trucks were being uh, tossed around in the vehicle uh, decks, a lot of damage happening. It was quite an experience. I really experienced the wild and, and uh, crazy weather that can beset uh, shipping traffic there. Now, this is not only a wild coast, it's, it's really a rich coast. And uh, we've heard a lot about the fish resource, especially salmons, from my, my colleague, the member from Port Moody, Coquitlam. And for mill millennia, First Nation cultures have relied on the diverse, this diversity, this richness, and the local economy today continues to rely heavily on fisheries and tourism. Now, I want to start off by talking about this rich natural heritage of that coast. The northern BC coast is one of the richest in the world. Great rivers like the Stikine and the Skeena carry nutrients from the interior to the coast where they mix in rich estuaries with marine waters. Currents, like the Alaska Current, uh, bring up more nutrients to the surface from the bottom sediments of the continental shelf. The cold waters of the Alaska Current hold high concentrations of oxygen, and the result is a natural diversity that is truly unbelievable, truly amazing. One example, and you know, this topic may never have been brought up in this chamber before, but sea stars, starfish as many of us call them. British Columbia, the British Columbia coast has the highest diversity of sea stars in the world. Uh, you may not have known that, but if you've been kayaking along the coast of Haida Gwaii, Burnaby uh, Narrows, you can see the leather stars, bat stars, sunflower stars, and many more. It's just incredible, and that's just one example of that diversity. And at the other end of the spectrum, we have marine mammals, whales, dolphins, porpoises, fur seals, sea lions, seals, and sea otters, that uh, mammal that brought Europeans to that, the British Columbia coast, really fueled the European exploration of the coast, first contacts with First Nations peoples because of their fine furs, fine furs that cannot withstand a drop of oil or the animal will die because those animals require that fur to be in pristine condition. Now there's been some, for many years, uh, the whales were 
uh, harvested off the coast in great numbers. Their numbers declined uh, almost to extirpation and extinction. But there's been some good news stories. The, the humpback whales, the gray whales, have really recovered in dramatic fashion. And you can now see uh, hundreds or thousands of them over a season along the coast. And off the uh, west coast of Haida Gwaii, down at Cape St. James and other places, the, the uh, land drops precipitously off into the waters. There's very little continental shelf, and sperm whales come close to the shore. And if you are down at Cape St. James, you look up at the big cliffs that f go straight into the water, you see thousands and thousands of seabirds, uh, and thousands of uh, common mures, and puffins. Another thing about puffins, British Columbia has three species of puffins. The Atlantic coast, only one. I'm looking for some Atlantic MPs. But you only have one on the Atlantic. There's three on the, the Pacific coast. And they're all there in, in British Columbia. Uh, there's another little relative of the puffin called the ancient murrelet. I'm going to go into birds here, Mr. Speaker, and I hope people will find this uh, educational. Uh, the ancient murrelet, half of the world's population breeds on Haida Gwaii, about uh, half a million birds. This is a little seabird that eats crustaceans uh, in, the, in the water shrimp, and they nest in burrows in, in the forest, and the young go off into the ocean when they're just tiny little downy things. Again, very, very uh, susceptible to any, any pollution. At the north end of Vancouver Island, the, which is the south end of this, uh, the area that this bill covers, is Triangle Island. Uh, Triangle Island has another species of seabird breeding on it in immense numbers, the Cassin's Ocelot. There's about a million pairs of Cassin's Ocelots that nest there. Uh, again, these are birds that are just indicators of the richness of what's in the water. And uh, we have to protect them. Albatrosses that come from Hawaii to feed on the BC coast and go back to Hawaii to feed their young. So I'd like to switch gears now and talk about the history of this oil tanker moratorium. Uh, you know, in the late 60s, there was actually oil drilling going off the BC coast. But in 1969, there was a big blowout at Santa Barbara that sent shockwaves through the industry and that drilling was stopped. And facing that threat and the, the uh, new shipments of oil coming south from Alaska, 1972, the federal government instituted a moratorium on oil tankers off the northern BC coast, but it was never put into law, and, and this is that first attempt to do that. Um, plans for drilling rose to the surface again in the 1980s, but two incidents put an end to those plans. One was the Nestuka barge, which collided with its own tug off the coast of Washington just before Christmas in 1988 and spilled about a million litres of Bunker C. That oil from the central Washington coast spread north, covered the entire west coast of Vancouver Island, all the way down into Oregon, about a thousand kilometres of coast. And the Nestuka was holding, or it spilled less than one-tenth of the amount of the limit that we're talking about here today in this bill. Not many people have heard of the Nestuka because three months later the Exxon Valdez went down uh, in southeastern Alaska, spilling 40 million litres of oil. And that disaster killed 250,000 seabirds, 2,800 sea otters, 300 seals, 250 eagles. The Alaska coast has never been the same. So you can see why many British Columbians are concerned about rep repeated plans for bulk oil transport along the BC coast. The tourism there, industry there is worth more than $780 million a year. Employ it creates more than 40,000 jobs. And fishery is also a key for the local economy. $100 million worth of uh, input into the economy from that industry. 2,500 people work in the fishery and more in processing. So, Mr. Speaker, I'm happy to support Bill C-48. It puts into law a policy that's been in place for almost a half century. The NDP has supported the moratorium through those years, and we, as I mentioned before, we're concerned about several aspects of the legislation. One is the limit of 12,500 tonnes of oil allowed for community and industry supply. But, you know, the vessels that supply these communities are now all well under 1,000 tonnes in size, so it's unclear what's, why such a high limit was put in place. 
we'd like to see that lowered significantly. And secondly, we're concerned about the amount of ministerial discretion in this bill, allowing the minister to exempt vessels and define what fuels are covered. But we will consider, continue to support the bill as it is a step in the right direction that protects the British Columbia coast. Thank you. Questions and